Yes, yes, of course. The Brussels were informed first. No, Artillery Age, we didn't think it was suitable. All our agents are instructed to report to us first before proceeding any further. No, that will be quite in order. This authorizes me to collect all intelligence reports which might throw some light upon the assassination of the Grand Duke Sergei. I understand that some of these are in the possession of this office of the secret police. That is the signature of Mr. Lapuchin. I'm sorry, sir, but I shall have to query this direct with the palace. Mr. Lapuchin is head of the police force. Since the murder of the Grand Duke, sir, that is a matter of conjecture. some time to track you down. You know, I'd say if you're a very difficult fellow to get a hold of. I hope so. Is that food? Thought you might be hungry. What a splendid chap you are. Sakuski. I see you've read the news. The Grand Duke passed away. I understand they had to retrieve certain organs from the chimney tops. <laughs> My very favorite dish. Because of this, Lapuchin's head is on the block. He had it coming to him. Who? The Grand Duke or the Chief of Police? Both of them. Is there any speculation about who replaced this Lapuchin? There is. Who's in the running? Me. <laughs> you. I've been summoned. Scraping the bottom of the barrel, aren't they? Were you responsible for the murder of the Grand Duke? Me? Mm -hmm. I've just got back from Paris. I've never been to Moscow in my life. What about the murder of Plava? <laughs> that was no great loss. I'm going to give you a lecture, my dear fellow. The fact is, you cannot go around anymore blowing up members of the Imperial government. At least, not without the odd eyebrow being raised. We're coming out of the Dark Ages. Civilization is nearly upon us. You won't get the job. You have too many enemies. If I do, you're going to have to make up your mind just whose side you're on. In January 1905, hundreds of the Tsar's loyal subjects had been shot down in front of his palace at St. Petersburg. The massacre of Bloody Sunday, as the tragedy was called, shocked the civilized world and led to a national outcry for reform. The Tsar, Nicholas II, was about to accede to this, when, three weeks later, his uncle, the Grand Duke Sergei, was assassinated in Moscow. At this point, he began to change his mind. The Tsar dismissed his police chief, Lopuchin, and on the advice of his closest generals, summoned to his court at Tsarsko Silo a man called Rachkovsky. The former minister, Vita, out of favor because of his opposition to the Japanese war, was quick to hear of the visit and anxious to voice his apprehension. The post for which Rachkovsky was being considered was in normal times a minor one. 
but the man who occupied it in this period of confrontation had it in his power to direct the policies of the regime either towards reform or towards repression. It was this that Vita feared. It was Ratchkovsky who exposed the anarchists in Paris. It was Ratchkovsky who discovered the plot to blow up Liège Cathedral. And do you know why? Because Ratchkovsky's own men planted the bombs there in the first place. And later, when he was removed on your orders, his creatures, Ratev and Zobortov, took over. They have no love for him, I assure you. Nevertheless, they carry on his techniques. They have saturated the revolutionary movement with their own men. And when a bomb goes off, one does not know whether it is the work of a zealot or some overenthusiastic policeman seeking promotion. Are you suggesting that von Plever, my minister of the interior, was killed by one of his own men? I have heard rumors to that effect. And are you suggesting that my uncle, the Grand Duke Serge, was killed by a man in the pay of my own secret police? It is two years since you saw fit to resign from my cabinet. I have brought you here merely to sound out the possibility of peace with Japan and within minutes you are lecturing me on matters which do not concern you. In Witter's view, Rachkovsky was the candidate of the right. And not only that, he was the most dangerous exponent of counter-terrorist tactics ever to emerge from the labyrinths of the Russian secret police. Name, Theodore Ratchkovsky. Profession? Retired. You have an appointment. Would I have got this far without one? Name? The commander of the palace guard was General Hesse, an aristocrat with definite views on the political situation. It was he and his colleague General Tripov who had arranged for Ratchkovsky's interview. As you know, Ratchkovsky, the country is heading for revolution. We have an army which cannot be trusted, a police force which hesitates to use force. We of the palace guard offer a hard line, and the Tsar will not give us one. Yes, General. Then we may have to take things into our own hands. I mean, it may be necessary to remove the Tsar and put the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich in his place. You see, that is why we need men in power whom we can trust, Trachkovsky. Like yourself. Always at your command, my dear General. Theodore Ratchkovsky. Mr. Theodore Ratchkovsky. Banks will not issue a letter of security. Legally, for foreign nationals, shall not enter. There is no money. 
Your banks will Majesty. not issue loans. Unless it enforces its arms, legally forthcoming, it national shall not maintain our position against the Japanese Navy. 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 It would seem to me, Admiral, you have little position to maintain. But I am quite convinced these ships do not exist. And I am quite convinced they do. Willie, why don't you go to Paris and verify the details? Does seem to me a bit odd that you're willing to buy four battleships sight unseen from the South American Republic. Mr. Theodore Rachkovsky, sir. If you want to crush the Japs, sir, we shall need these ships. Sir, these ships do not exist, except in the imagination of the man who's trying to sell them. We have no ships. The Pacific Squadron has been destroyed, the Black Sea Squadron is bottled up, and the Baltic Squadron, if it ever gets... And Kokotsov, if you feel so sceptical, why don't you send someone from the Treasury to Paris along with the Admiral here? I certainly shall, sir. Very well. But I would just like to advise Minister Kokotsov here that his negative attitude may set back our victory in the Pacific by at least a year. That will be all, gentlemen. Your Majesty. Sit down, Mr. Ratchkowski. I have been considering the appointment of a new head of security in the St. Petersburg area, and your name has been brought to my notice. It is not, of course, unfamiliar to me. I thought the post was most ably filled by Mr. Lapuchin. Mr. Lapuchin has tendered his resignation. As chief of security, he was responsible for the safety of the Grand Duke. My uncle's death is a great shock to me. You were never close, but... That does not diminish my grief. Now, I must first ask you, if you are offered the post, are you in a position to accept it? In whatever capacity Your Majesty so desires I serve, I will serve. The reports that I have received of my uncle's death place the responsibility on the battle organization of the social revolutionaries, and this is led by a man called Adseth, I believe. That is so. There is a rumor in St. Petersburg that Atsef is in the pay of the secret police. Such is the political climate of today that rumors like these easily gain weight and momentum. They contribute to the forces of anarchy, they destroy the very fabric of society. Is it we... true that my uncle's murderer is in the pay of my own intelligence service? Sir, I have been out of the force for some time. What I want to know is, did you at any time in the past recruit Atsef for any of his accomplices. Sir, you are talking about the murderers of your uncle. Mr. Vitter, my esteemed minister, has characterized your contribution to the Secret Service as follows. A pioneer of provocation tactics. If the French invented the term agent provocateur, it is Ratchkovsky, he says, who refined it. Mr. Vite is no friend of mine, and I'm reluctant to accept such a compliment even from him. He points out that you were dismissed from your position as head of the Foreign Service five years ago on the basis of this report. It was signed, I believe, by uh, Mr. Lapuchin, if I remember correctly. In whom? Through bitter experience, I now have no confidence. However, it was proved that you used your position as head of case section to obtain information which led you to making several fortunes on the stock exchange. Sir, since I left your service, I've made several more. Is that also to be held against me? No. Uh -huh. Your efficiency in that direction, though a subject of scandal, does not concern me. There is, however, one aspect of the report which does. The Philippe affair. As head of case section, you made secret inquiries concerning the relationship of my wife and a certain holy man, Father Philippe. This was done without my knowledge. Your Majesty, the matter was becoming a subject of scandal. 
your inquiries did not make it any the less so. My wife is a deeply religious woman. A dossier on every person who attaches themselves to her court was hardly likely to please her. I would like to remind you, sir. I'm sure, Mr. Ratchkowski, your first consideration was for myself. But you failed to realize that I and the procurator of the Holy Synod were already dissuading her from her spiritual infatuation with Philippe when your report came in. Father Philippe was a charlatan. Father Philippe prayed to God to give her a son. God gave her a son. Your Majesty, the petite parade is at one o'clock. I must respectfully point out to your highness that etiquette demands that you wear a naval uniform for this occasion. You may attend me later, Mr. Ratchkowski. since your day here. It is a present from the Kaiser. In case you don't get the message, it represents our Imperial Majesty beating back the Yellow Peril single-handed. How do you like it? It's a trifle unsubtle. Unlike you, Rachkovsky. Tell me, Mr. Vita, do you think there'll be peace this year? If there is not, sir, we shall have revolution. His Imperial Majesty, Tsar of all the Russians. Ah, gentlemen. I see we're all here. Peter, Kokotsov, dear friend. Well, Trepov, how is St. Peter's work? Safe enough now for your majesty to return. Not only that, I guarantee you a joyous welcome. The people miss their little father. Tell me, Trepov, have you managed to whitewash this shabby episode yet? And their ringleader, the saintly Father Gapon, where is he? Fled the country. I think he realizes that he bears a responsibility for what happened that day. I bear the responsibility. 500 of my people are dead, shot down in front of my palace. The responsibility... The blame is Gapon's. He led the march without permission. And nevertheless, one cannot but regard the episode... Let us close the incident. Sir, the city is back to normal. I'm sure if you'd been there in the first place, trip off the... The incident would never have occurred. If that damned fool Lapuchin had done his job. Lapuchin is being replaced. Oh? By whom? I have not as yet made up my mind. But um, Mr. Ratchkovsky has indicated his willingness to serve. You know my opinion. I think that is a very bad idea. Such an appointment will be seen as a move to the right at a time when I understood your majesty to be conceding overdue reforms on individual liberties. I have conceded the reform. And at the same time, staffing your security forces with hardliners, there's a contradiction there somewhere. The country is too unstable for reforms. However, given two or three years of firm government, things may be different. You mean a police state? Because that is what is implied when you introduce men like your friend there. Even the palace will not be safe from inquiries. That's it, isn't it, Ratchkovsky? When it comes to meddling in other people's affairs, nothing is sacred. If you say so, Mr. Vita, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, gentlemen, mark by your left. Ease forward two paces there.
Tall is on the right, short is on the left, sir. But I want them the other way round. Sir. Where are the citations? On the table, sir. Right, gentlemen. We will reposition with speed and precision. Tallest on the left, shortest on the right. Now. But they, too, will have to be rearranged. Well, get someone to do it. Ask by your left. Ease and see if His Majesty is ready yet. I didn't know that Chile had a navy. According to Abatza, they have four battleships, and what is more, they are for sale. Yes, for 25 million. You don't trust Admiral Abatza. I'm sending him to Paris. With 25 million, my God, you'll never see it again. <laughs> I resent that, sir. As an officer in the Imperial Navy, on behalf of the Admiral, I must protest most strongly. I was merely jesting, General. When I said I didn't trust him, I meant his judgment, not his integrity. The Admiral needs the ships. The way he's losing the Baltic fleet piecemeal, no wonder. Why don't you give the money directly to Japan and cut out the middlemen? Well, for a man who took no interest in the war... On the contrary. You! You resigned at the outset and... My views on the war the are a matter of record. I am against it. Gentlemen, gentlemen. That remark was uncalled for, Mr. Vitter. We are very proud of our Navy. Gentlemen, His Imperial Majesty, Tsar of all the Russians. Your Majesty, we are here to honor the brave. Well, I see, General. Give me the bread. Here, let me do it. Sika Konstantinovich Fedorova, for outstanding bravery at the Battle of the River Agia. face of overwhelming odds, did defend his comrades without thought to his own safety. The Medal for Outstanding Gallantry. Tell me in your own words, Sika Konstantinovich. I was concerned only for my brothers. Anton Ivanovich Morstoy. Vladimir Vladimirovich Norkova for outstanding bravery aboard his ship which caught fire. Regardless of his own personal safety, did put out many fires and thereby saved many lives. You were at Port Arthur. There were thousands more. Why choose me, little father? Because you lived to tell the tale, my friend. Alexei Ivanovich Sotzini. We failed you. We failed you, little father. We've all failed you. No, I failed you and your comrades. But, Your Majesty, we would die for you. Yes, little father, we would die for you. 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 Ivan Ivanovich Morgoth. General, yes! Do something about this shambles! Do you think I'm becoming soft, Rachkovsky? Only yesterday I signed two proclamations establishing an assembly and the right to petition. I would say this was a tactical move, sir. You misunderstand my position. And so does the good Trepov. Did you hear him tell me it was now safe for the Tsar to return to St. Petersburg? 
as if it were ever not so. I am here at Sarkoyselo because I like it. Not because 900 men tried to cross the palace square in St. Petersburg to present me with their grievances and were shot down for their trouble. It is not me that is not safe in St. Petersburg, but my people. What happened that Sunday was a series of errors in judgment made by men in whom I had every confidence. And the result is that I, I have been caricatured across the pages of the world press as a tyrant. I love my people! And they love me. Witness that demonstration in the hall just now. Well, admittedly, there are areas of misunderstanding between us. A, a gap which is fed by firebrands and intellectuals, Jews and Masons, and, and men who have made it their mission to destroy the people's love for me. And yet I'm, I'm cursed by administrators who are so blinded by their own ambitions. They, they cannot see a major catastrophe within ten feet of their noses. This is what the Grand Duke Vladimir announces to the press when the corpses of the dead still melt the snow. We prevented the assemblage. It's time the country was returned to the professionals. Tell me, is there any reality to this talk of revolution? Yes, sir, there is. Sir, when you tap a barometer and it points to rain, that doesn't necessarily mean we shall all be drowned in the flood. Hmm. I've made arrangements for you to have Tea with Her Majesty. It's her wish that uh, she talk to you before I um, make up my mind. I understand, sir. Ah, Rachkovsky. That'll be all, gentlemen. Well, I am to have tea with Her Majesty. He won't make a decision. I think it would be a good idea if we had a word with uh, Anna Barubova. No. She's the closest to Her Majesty. Uh, granted. But we will have to pay a high price for her cooperation. It's unnecessary. You are too confident. General, as governor of St. Petersburg, is it still necessary you get your way by carrying favors with ladies of the Imperial Bedchamber? Now listen to me, Rechkovsky. I put you up for this job. Who else was there? Russia is faced with revolution. Within three months, it's likely to be upon us. Bulyagin will at once be sacked. You're likely to be promoted Minister of the Interior. And when that happens, do you really think the crude tactics you employ as governor of St. Petersburg can be extended across the country? And forget we're not dealing with a few anarchists, but with groups of peasants and workers we're beginning to realize their strength lies in unity. The march on the Winter Palace, fast so it might have been, is the beginning of something new. And if we lose the war against Japan and the army turns upon its officers, your problem, General, will multiply. I tell you, your best chance lies with the intelligence forces. You must use them to divert the course of history and turn the revolutionary movement in upon itself. Its committees must be controlled by police agents. Anarchy must not be stamped out, but actively encouraged. 
Just as a forest fire can be brought under control by the judicious use of counterfires, so the excesses of the movement must be exposed to the people by the continued use of provocation tactics. This is a dangerous game. And it needs a cool head to see that it doesn't get out of hand, as it did in Moscow last week, when the Grand Duke Sergei was murdered. Now, if you're bringing me in to do this, it'll be on my terms, not those of Anna Vyrubova or any other tart in the royal household. Furthermore, the post you're offering me isn't good enough. It doesn't give me control of Moscow, or the foreign section, or the uniformed police. To be effective, other posts must evolve from it. Special commissioner to the police department would be one, vice director of the foreign section another. And in return, I will advise the Tsar that you, General, be made assistant minister of the interior. You will advise the Tsar? But, but that, Rachkovsky, will place me under you. Until the time comes when you take over the ministry yourself. You're fabricating a future for all of us when the present is not yet assured. You have to be two steps ahead in this game. Suppose... Suppose you don't get the appointment. Suppose I do, my dear Trepov, and I don't accept it. Where does that leave you? I forgot. You were dismissed before he was born. On your instructions. Flatter me that I have such power. Influence. I have never understood, Mr. Rechkovsky, your motives for the investigation of my friend, Father Philippe. At the time, I was too angry to ask, for I considered your investigation to be a direct affront to my person. At the time, Your Majesty, I was trying to protect Your Majesty. I was overzealous in my duty and was quite rightly reprimanded. Father Philippe seemed to me to be a charlatan and an imposter. And the reports that have subsequently come in seem to have confirmed my original opinion. He is no longer in your favor, I believe. You do not understand. When a man bears the great burden of the spirit, he may sometimes fall into the most awful depravity in an effort to escape the powers given him by God. Father Philippe did have many failings, but he also had great powers. I do not know which of these you feared the most. I was alarmed, ma'am, by the combination. At least you speak your mind, Mr. Rechkovsky. The death of the Grand Duke Sergei was a bureaucratic blunder. 
News of the assassination attempt was known to the St. Petersburg Okrana, but they failed to convince the Moscow office to take it seriously. As for the events of Bloody Sunday, this also was a, an administrative error. Had I not been discharged from my post, both these tragedies could have been avoided. You seem to have turned the tables on me, Mr. Rachkovsky. I anticipated that you would come here a suppliant to say that you had learnt your lesson. I am, ma'am. Um, and I have. You do not give me that impression. I also take it that you have modified your attitude towards me. Or why else would you have countenanced my having tea with you this afternoon? So what is at issue is not the appointment, but the terms. I trust my husband. If he says you are necessary for the safety of the state, I believe him. But I do not want you to interfere in my affairs or what occurred before will occur again. Point is taken. You are to be left alone with your holy people. There are boundaries beyond the can of governments. That I now understand, ma'am. There is a spiritual world, or do you not believe in it? You do not. I do, Your Majesty. What I am dealing with and what you are dealing what with. What I am dealing with is life. I wanted a son. What could you, with all your manipulations, do to provide me with one? You have provided the Tsar with an heir. The methods were unorthodox. But now that you have given him one, I shall do my best to protect him. Although you may, from time to time, find my way unorthodox too. These are the reports regarding the Manchurian campaign. Arrangements will have to be made for the state funeral of the Grand Duke. And then there's some correspondence with the French ambassador relating to emigre activities in Imperial Paris. Imperial Majesty. Mr. Ratchkowski, sir. That'll be all. You saw Her Majesty. We have made our peace. Very well. I appoint you chief of the St. Petersburg Secret Police, with special regard to our own welfare. The articles of appointment will be drawn up in the morning. Sir, the position does not carry the power necessary to discharge the responsibilities. In order to see that certain tragic events do not reoccur, I shall require two further posts. Name them. Now a gavot performs sedately Offer your hand with conscious pride Take an attitude not too stately Still sufficiently dignified under the new liberal order. There's nothing I can do about it. The whole of Russia will be here tomorrow. Village. 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 Village.
Sir, I've been here long enough. Your Honour, sir. The right of the petition, sir. Yes. As recognised by the proclamation of February the 18th, sir. Yes. My son has been unjustly accused by the Okrana and Antiques, sir. He's been sent to Siberia, sir. And I have walked 1,000 versts, sir, to bear witness to his innocence. You say you come from Antique? Yes, sir. Mm. And that your son has been unjustly imprisoned? Yes, sir. And you have walked 1,000 versts? Yes, sir. And in every village that you stopped, and in every house that gave you shelter, you proclaimed the innocence of your son. Yes, sir. Thereby implying that your holy father, the Tsar, is a tyrant? No, sir. General yes. Hesse, confine this man to the Peter and Paul prison. Guard, take this man away. Oh, oh, yes, I hope I've done the right thing. So much for palace security. Tell me, did you get the job? Yes. <laughs> you cunning old fox. Throughout the summer, despite isolated incidents, the prospect of revolution seemed remote. But in the countryside, the plight of the peasants became more desperate. And in the cities, the seeds of revolution continued to germinate. Massive unemployment and appalling living conditions led to a growing feeling of hopelessness. In September, a wave of strikes swept Russia. At first, they were purely economic, but soon their overtones became political. The strikes led to riots, and the riots to insurrection. Scarcely believing their good fortune, exiled revolutionaries poured back into Russia. There was an armed uprising in Moscow, and in Kronstadt, the Navy rebelled. In St. Petersburg, an alternative government was set up by Trotsky. And on the far side of the city, Rachkovsky, running true to form, created a squad known as the Black Band. Its job, assassination. I think you got the wrong one, Sergeant. It's his brother. Oh, well, we'll try again tomorrow. No. Wait till the funeral. He's bound to attend it. Of course. And what are you going to do about Atsev, sir? Yes. Atsev was at the head of the police chief's death list. Yet despite this, the two continued their clandestine meetings, where Rachkovsky acquired valuable information about the revolutionary movements. Yes, it's time. Trace his whereabouts. Extra men, if necessary. Unknown to Atsev, Rachkovsky had another highly placed informer, Father Gapon. The land was God's! They've taken it! This saintly figure who had led the march on the Winter Palace had fallen under Rachkovsky's influence. The police chief had flattered him, appealed to his conscience. And when that had not worked, to his vanity and greed. Over 100,000 rubles was paid into Father Gapon's account, a record for an informer at that time. He was later hanged by the revolutionaries as a traitor. Nicholas acceded at last to the pleas of the reformers. A parliament was elected called the Duma, and Vita was named as the Tsar's chief minister. But the business of law and order remained with the generals. Sir, I beg of you. I have given you your Duma. What more do you want? Hello? Hello? You give with one hand and take away with the other. The country's in a state of chaos. The peasants are up to their old tricks. Now they're burning and shooting. Order will be restored, sir, if you will trust your squires, your lawyers, and your country doctors. This is the class that can bring the people back to their senses. But they must have a say in how the country is run. I've given them a parliament. 
And I've placed you at the head of it, and what good has that done? And you have placed yourself at the head of this land league, a reactionary body if ever there was one. You ignore the Black Hundreds when they burn villages and murder Jews, and you employ men like Rachkovsky, who uses his power so ruthlessly that he ferments the very anarchy that we are now trying to prevent. Rubbish, litter. The people want to know how you stand. The Tsar stands above politics. Without the Tsar, the country would disintegrate. Sir, if we continue in this way, it will. Foreign investment will be cut. Our industrialization program will fragment. It, hello. Is that Trepov? I want to speak to General Trepov. If we look into the future, if we look at Germany and its expansionism and the dangers that that will bring... Look into the future, Mr. Vitter. When my mother still waits two weeks at the border and I still cannot raise a regiment to convey her safely to St. Petersburg. Hello. You have talked about our inefficiency, Prime Minister. This country has always been inefficient. You tell me of the revolt of the peasantry, the peasants are always revolting. The anarchy in our cities. The workers comprise 3.5% of the population and you preach to me your representative democracy. For what? You're talking like a European, Mr. Vitter, while I am talking about Russia. Hello? Trepov? This is Nicholas Alexandrovich, czar of all the Russians. Fetch me to Repoff. We shall survive, Mr. Vitter, if only to prove that the one force for unity on the continent is the Tsar. For weeks, the fate of Russia appeared to hang in the balance. And to those who defended Moscow, or the barriers of the St. Petersburg Soviet, it appeared as if the very bastions of autocracy were about to fall. But the generals were only biding their time until fresh troops could reach the centers of rebellion. And when they did, Moscow was stormed by the crack Semyonovsky regiment, with Trepov's words still ringing in their ears, do not spare the cartridges. The revolution was put down with violence and bloodshed. According to Plekhanov, the father of Russian Marxism, it had been from its beginning an act of suicidal folly. After the fall of Moscow, punitive expeditions were sent into the countryside. And where these were not available, the Black Hundreds were only too ready to oblige. In the words of a popular song, the Tsar lost his nerve so he issued a manifesto. Freedom to the dead, imprisonment or exile for the living. Loud. Amongst those who survived were Kerensky, Trotsky and Lenin. I'm going to miss you. I shall be back, believe me. You're all washed up, my dear fellow. I'll throw in the towel on as even. You're out of date. You and the whole movement. There's a new type coming up. Deadly dull compared with you, but in the long run, twice as dangerous. You just soon throw a book of economics as a bomb. His weapons are the demonstration and the strike. You're talking about a bunch of agitators? Oh, no. They're out to build a new Russia, not just tear down the old. I have a list of names here. When you get to Paris, uh, I want you to promise to keep an eye on them. And in return, I might even see you safe across the border. Will I report direct to you? No. No, as soon as the country's pacified, they'll find some reason to dismiss me. They always do, when the dirty work is finished. No, no, I shall return. I'll wait for the next turn of the circle. After all, that's what revolution means, doesn't it? So who do I contact? You'll be informed. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's some mopping up to be done. 
Rachkovsky was right. It was less than a year since he had walked into Atsev's apartment, yet the revolution was already over. Within six months, the government had found reasons to dispense with his services, and when the next turn of the circle came, he was dead. Nine years of peace followed, and the Tsar was able to get out and meet his beloved people again. He dispensed with his experiments in democracy, dissolved the Duma, and dismissed Vita. But the country was never to be the same again. Some people had learned their lesson, others had not. Thank you.